Good morning. This is Pastor Jay Beckley from Stone Creek Bible Church in Temecula, California. And we are just excited that you are here today. And to make it a little bit easier for you to understand what I'm saying, I'm going to take my mask off. But uh, be assured that our people are out here wearing masks and we're socially distancing and we're doing the things that we need to do to keep people safe and uh, still worshiping the Lord. And uh, we're in Luke chapter 7 today, the story of the widow of Nain. In 1976, I had the privilege of going to Israel with a bunch of my buddies when, you know, in seminary. And one of the things we did was we drove up to the Jezreel Valley, which is in the northern part of Israel. And it was breathtaking. I will never forget standing at the site of uh, Megiddo, the, the stables that Solomon built in approximately 950 BC. Solomon had stables at Megiddo that housed over 10,000 horses and 4,000 chariots uh, for his army. And uh, this fortress is right next to the main pass that goes along the, the, the highway called the Via Maris from Babylon to Cairo in Egypt. And it goes right through Galilee and then around uh, Galilee to Megadala, a fishing village on the western uh, side of Galilee where Mary Magdalene grew up in a little fishing village selling uh, dried fish to caravanners on their way to Egypt. And these caravanners would leave Magdala and they would go up this slope and around the eastern side of Mount Tabor and down through the Jezreel Valley to Megiddo and they would go through the pass in the mountains uh, where they would have to go, the armies would have to, or the caravans would shrink down to single file. They would go through this pass and it would come out on the other side in the coastal area of Israel. And then they would go down along the coast and through the desert and over into the Egypt, Egypt, the, the, uh, the basin of the river Nile. And so Jesus is ministering in Capernaum. And we've talked about that several times, how he literally was, he started his ministry in a small fishing village, which was really like a caravan stop, like a truck stop in modern terms. You know, it's where the truckers would stop to pick up some food uh, before they went on their way. And Jesus grew up in this little town of Nazareth. Well, if you find Nazareth on your map, you will notice that Nazareth is up on a hill. It's about 800 or 1,000 feet higher than the Jezreel Valley. And there is a cliff on the, on the northern or the southern edge of Nazareth called the Precipice. And it's where a few weeks ago we talked about the rulers of the synagogue. They, Jesus came there. He read this passage from Isaiah. And he said, you know, I'm the one this passage is talking about. And they got mad. And they dragged him out to the precipice, the edge of the cliff in Nazareth. And they were going to throw him off and stone him. Well, going there... In Israel, you stand on the precipice and you look out over this amazing valley. You know, it's 45 miles long. It's about 20 miles across. And they grow everything that you can imagine uh, that will grow in Israel grows in the Jezreel Valley. And the word Jezreel means God sows. And it's like they're saying, this is the place where God grows stuff. And it's amazing. Well, Jesus, as a teenager growing up in Nazareth, I think he would have been drawn out to this precipice mountain. It's a great place to go out alone. It's a great place to go and meditate. It's a great place to uh, just spend some time in prayer. And I think Jesus went out there all the time as a young boy growing up. And one of the things that happens when you're sitting there on the precipice at the edge of Nazareth and you're looking down 800 feet to this fertile farm valley below, it's like a, it's like a quilted patchwork of different colored crops. It's just absolutely amazing. Well, if you look over at about nine o'clock, there's what looks like a giant salad bowl turned upside down in the middle of this fertile plain. And that's called Mount Tabor. Some people think that's where the transfiguration took place. And so when Jesus was a boy, he was looking over there at Mount Tabor going, I wonder what in the world that happened over there. Well, there's stories about Deborah and Barak and the armies of Israel. And, you know, um, when uh, Jael, <laughs> the, the woman in the tent, uh, killed the captain of the armies of, of uh, Hazor. Uh, his name was Sisera. And she literally nailed him to the ground with a tent peg and a big wooden mallet. And so then you look across a little bit from, from Tabor, you come to about 11 o'clock, and you see this little mountain range that kind of divides the valley in half. It's called um, the, the Hill of the Teacher. And uh, today it's called Ed Dewey. It's like an Arab name for Hill of the Teacher. And on the, 
side of that hill about halfway up, nestled into a, like what looks like a little cove in the side of the mountain is this village called Nain. And it's where our story is today. And the word Nain means pleasant. It's just fitting. It's just, it's just, it's like the perfect little place to have a village. And it would overlook their farmland and they would be able to get up above the bugs and during the rainy season they wouldn't be stuck in the mud. And they have a cemetery on the eastern edge of town. And it's this little town with probably five or six hundred people. And it's called Pleasant. It's like Mayberry RFD Jesus style, you know. But all around this little hill, the hill of the teacher, are these places that would remind a Jewish young person of stories from the Old Testament. At the eastern edge of this ridge, down kind of in the plain, is a town called Endor. And it's where Saul went to consult with the witch of Endor. Uh, and she supposedly raised the spirit of Samuel and gave Saul some instructions. And so Endor is right there next to the village of Nain. As a young Israelite boy, he would have no doubt enjoyed talking with his friends about the, the, the story of the Shunammite. <laughs> a young girl named Abishag, and uh, sh she lived in a town named Shunem, which is right on the other side of this hill from Nain. It's, they're like literally half a mile apart, just on the other side of the hill. Well, when King David was getting old, uh, a bunch of his advisors decided that it would probably be good for him if he had a young, beautiful girl to sleep with. And so they had a beauty contest. It's kind of like a precursor to the story of um, Esther in the book of Esther. It's like the, the David version of Esther. And so they send the, these old guys out to find the most beautiful girl in all of Israel. And they find the farmer's daughter in this little village of Shunem on the other side of the city of Nain. And they bring her to Jerusalem and she becomes David's nurse and lives in his harem. And uh, his sons fight over her after he dies. And, and Solomon winds up with her in the harem. And then he writes a book of the Bible called the Song of Solomon. And some scholars believe that uh, it's about this girl, the farmer's daughter from Shunem, who gets taken to Jerusalem and he falls in love with her and pursues her and wins her heart. And that love story, kind of a Romeo and Juliet love story, is there in the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. It's, it's kind of amazing. A few hundred years later, the prophet Elijah uh, goes to Shunem. And this wealthy woman builds him a, a little room in her house so that when he passes through town, he can stay there. And then a couple years later, she's kind of talking with him while he's staying at her house one day. And he realizes, oh, this, young, this woman who's married to a much older man, she's like really not happy that she won't be able to have children. And so they, they talk. And then Elijah says to her, you know what? Next time this year, uh, this, this time next year, when I come to visit, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> See you later, grandma, you know, or like mommy. And uh, he comes back and she has a baby, sure, sure enough. And so you can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 4. And uh, he uh, then continues to come back to her house. And when the, when the kid is about five, uh, he gets sick and dies. And she's brokenhearted. And she carries the baby up to the upper room, the room that Elijah stayed in. And she lays the baby on Elijah's bed. And then we read in 1 Kings chapter um, 2 Kings 4, that she runs out to the field to her husband and uh, she talks her husband into giving her a donkey and a servant and she hightails it about 12 miles down along the edge of the Jezreel Valley to Carmel, Mount Carmel, where, where Elijah has his house. And she gets Elijah and she pleads with him to come back and to help her with her son. And he comes back and winds up raising her son from the dead. Now this takes place in Shunem, on the back side of the hill of the teacher, the other side of the hill from Nain, Elijah is raising a baby from the dead, um, what, 800 years before Christ. So the Bible has more than just a few stories of people rising from the dead. And so Jesus grew up looking at these little places that all have stories from the Old Testament. On the other side of the hill of the teacher is Mount Gilboa, and it makes a big um, kind of a horseshoe shaped um, uh, cove in this valley of Jezreel and it's where King Saul was killed by a Philistine army. It's where he ran from the army and the arrow, the guy shot an arrow and killed King Saul. And then as Jesus would have looked across the Jezreel Valley, he would have, he would have been able to see from Nazareth this uh, pass in the mountains at Megiddo, which 
we sometimes refer to as Armageddon. And it's the overlook for the Valley of Jezreel, where the book of Revelation talks about at the end of days, the nations will gather against Israel uh, and make a great army. And then Jesus will come and disband that army or destroy that army in the Valley of Jezreel. And it's just this, this place where Jesus grew up is just so full of Old Testament. And as we read our story today, I can't help but think that part of what Jesus was doing was staking his claim when he went to the village of Nain. And we will read um, this passage from Luke chapter 7. And you'll see, it's, there's very little description, there's very little reason for, for you know, communicating this uh, narrative, except there is a change in this passage, 10 verses. Everything changes. And as we read through these 10 verses, I want you to see if you can figure out the secret to this passage. What changes as we read down through this passage? And Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 11. And it came to pass soon afterwards. Okay, so some translations say the next day. So this happens immediately after Jesus heals the servant of the centurion at the beginning of Luke 7. And we talked about that last week, so I'm not going to go into it. You can read that first part of chapter 7. And it came to pass the next day that he went to a city called Nain. Now Nain is 25 miles from Capernaum. The Jews begin their day at sunset with dinner. That's the beginning of the new day in the Jewish culture. And so when it says that the next day Jesus went to Nain, the implication is that he ate dinner on the next day, which was in the evening, and then he got up from dinner and he did what desert dwellers do and they travel at night. So he would have gotten up, he would have left uh, Capernaum and then made the 25 mile journey to Nain and got there sometime after noon uh, on that same day, the day that began at six o'clock the night before. <laughs> like, okay, so there's a little bit of uh, fun stuff in the background here. And he went to a city called Nain, which means pleasant. And we don't know, you know, anything else about this, except that Jesus would have known that this was the place where Elijah raised this infant 800 years before him. And he, his disciples, went with him. So he had 12 guys, maybe a few of the wives, possibly a couple of kids, and a great multitude. <laughs> so what's a great multitude? Uh, it's a great multitude. It's too many people to count. It's probably several hundred people. We know that Jesus had 72 disciples beyond the 12 who were kind of like faithfully committed regulars at his, at his um, sermons and at his church meetings. And uh, they helped him to deal with, you know, people in the crowd and uh, they did all kinds of things for Jesus. We also know that when he was in Capernaum healing the centurion's slave, there were a whole bunch of other people there from Judea, which is basically the southern part of Israel where Jerusalem is, and they were Pharisees and scribes. So there was a bunch of people there. And some commentators speculate that what was happening was these people from Judea were returning home, perhaps even for a feast, for one of the feasts that all of the Israelites were supposed to go, for, go to. So it's possible that this wasn't just a trip to Nain. It's possible that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem for one of the feasts that took place during his ministry. And there were three a year. So for Jesus' three-year ministry, he would, there would have been nine feasts in Jerusalem where he as a young, able-bodied man would have made that mandatory journey 60 miles from Nazareth or Capernaum uh, down to Jerusalem. So he was a pretty fit guy. You imagine if you did a 60 mile hike three times a year, <laughs> like, whoa, <laughs> you'd be in pretty good shape. You'd stay in pretty good shape. Good thing. So Jesus gets to this little village on the side of a mountain in the middle of the Jezreel Valley, and it's just gorgeous. And they're walking up there. And verse 12, now when he drew near to the gate of the city, behold, there was carried out one that was dead, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city were with her. And that's the same word as the, the multitude that was with Jesus. If you're reading in the original language, Jesus had a crowd and there was a crowd coming out of the city. And they were carrying a, a, a casket or a, a, a funeral buyer, which was like a, basically like a, a cot or a stretcher 
that the body would have lain on and it would have been washed and it would have been wrapped up in burial clothes, linen cloths and wrapped uh, the way the Jews uh, did their burials in ancient times. And uh, so this passage, this story is about the meeting of the two crowds. One crowd going to the cemetery and one crowd going to the temple. And uh, so what happens? Jesus is out there leading one crowd up the, up the ridge trail on the way to the city of Nain. And it, the, as you read through the passage, you begin to get the feeling that Jesus encounters the widow as if she was walking in front of the, the burial buyer and the pallbearers and the funeral procession. And if she was walking alone without a husband, without any children, then you would know as you approached this thing that was happening that she was a widow. She was alone. She was alone at the beginning of the funeral procession. Oh my goodness, this poor woman. And then the passage says that when the Lord saw her, verse 13, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, weep not. And the, the words here are kind of strange. It really, it's, a, it's not like a judgment, like you shouldn't be doing this. It's like you don't need to be doing this. It's a, the, the words that are used indicate that what Jesus is saying here is you, lo, you no longer need to weep. And it would have confused her and shocked her and she would have like, you know, maybe kind of woken out of her, you know, funeral um, thing that she was in. And uh, then what's he do? And he comes near and he touches the buyer and the bearers stand still. Now, in Hebrew culture, touching the buyer of a dead person was, that was unclean. And you would only do that if you were willing to be unclean, which means you couldn't go to church. You had to, you know, take a bath and take a, a mikvah, a ritual bath, and you had to go make a sacrifice in order to get clean so you could go to church again. <clears throat> and the bearers stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. Whoa, can you imagine what that crowd, those two crowds must have experienced? Like what in the world is going on here? Who is this guy who talks to dead people and they sit up? Now I've had that, that vision or that daydream um, at funeral services before, you know, maybe if you've been there, you go up to the casket and you're recognizing who this person is and you're thinking about the things that you did with them and the conversations that you had and the fact that they are gone and they're, that this body is not them. They're not there anymore. And I love that, that reminder that we are not our bodies. We are a spirit. The Bible says we are a spirit, that we have an, an independent identity that is not, that doesn't require a body. Now, I know I'm getting a little bit weird here, but Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so the Apostle Paul believed that we have an independent, soulish, spiritual existence that's separate from our body. Well, and I, and I love that because it means when we die, we don't cease to exist. The Bible just says we, we, our spirit separates from our body for a period of time until our body is resurrected, which is one of the promises of scripture, that eventually God is gonna resurrect our body and he's gonna reunite our spirit and our body and we're gonna have a new opportunity to experience life uh, together as believers in Christ. And I love that. And here Jesus is basically through, what his, through his actions, he's teaching this theology. When the body died, this, this young man, the only child of his mother, he didn't cease to exist. He didn't disappear from the universe. You know, he went somewhere, maybe into God's presence, and Jesus called him back. And I wonder when he sat up, what was he saying? You know, I, well, I don't know. You know, maybe he was mumbling about the cloths being uncomfortable. You know, what's all this sticky stuff? Why can't I move my arms, you know? Or maybe he was saying, oh my gosh, I'm back here again. What happened? You know, I was having fun with Jesus and now all of a sudden I'm back here in Jezreel Valley. You know, like what in the world? You know, I don't know, but it sure makes an interesting story and it kind of invites us to identify with what's going on. <clears throat> and he that was dead sat up and he began to speak and, and, and he gave him to his mother. The, 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 the word there is very interesting and it reflects the way the story of Elijah returning the young child 
to his mother in, in the village of Shunem. When you read that story in 2 Kings chapter 4, we are told that Elijah presented the baby back to its mother or the child back to its mother. And that same language, even though it's not Hebrew, it's Greek. This is the Greek version of that same language. Jesus presented the son back to the mother. It's as if Luke is giving us a little hint, like, oh, if you've ever read that story of Elijah, that weird phrase about how he presents the baby, that's what's happening here. Because it's now Jesus raising the child from the dead. Which is kind of, I think it's kind of Luke's way of saying, hey, all you Jewish people out there who know that Elijah is a part of the Messiah story, <laughs> here's the connection. Jesus is the new Elijah. He's the prophet of God. And he's come to do something incredible that only God can do. Now then, verse 16. And fear took hold on all of them. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet is arisen among us. And, notice this phrase, God has visited his people. What in the world were they talking about? Jesus walks into the village with a crowd. He confronts this funeral procession. He raises this guy from the dead. And people are saying, God has visited his people. <laughs> Is that amazing? Like they recognize that only God could do this. And verse 17, And this report went forth concerning him in the whole of Judea and all the region round about. <laughs> Jesus didn't need a PR man. He didn't need Instagram. He didn't need Facebook. He didn't need any of those things. Because word of mouth just spread all over the place like wildfire. This guy, Jesus from Nazareth, raised a guy from the dead. <laughs> and you can't believe what he did and how it worked and what happened. And I think that story was a part of the, the, the Jesus news that just spread everywhere. It definitely was part of the gospel. The gospel is that God loves us and cares about us and forgives our sin and promises to raise us from the dead. And I think this is a very subtle way of Luke starting to bring these themes to a point as he tells the story of Jesus' ministry. So let's review for just a second. We know from this story that Jesus cared about the people in Nain. He hiked 25 miles overnight to get there. He showed up in the nick of time. And then he raised this guy back to life. Oh my goodness, God cares about us. And when Jesus shows up and interrupts, you know, weep not. <laughs> What a strange thing to say to a widow. Weep not, you know. Stop. You know, when Jesus shows up in your life, stop and let him work. You know, quit working your plan and start asking, what's his plan? Give him the glory. Give him the glory. When he raised that dead guy, those people around were like, oh my goodness, a prophet is here. God is among us. God is doing something wonderful in our lives. And they gave God the glory. Jesus was moved by compassion. Are we? You know, when we people see people suffering, are we moved to get involved? You know, he reached out and touched the funeral buyer. He was willing to get his hands dirty in order to minister to people who needed to know that God loves them, you know? And I sometimes think about what we're going through in this COVID world, you know? We're isolated and we're all experiencing the, this kind of strange depression that seems to hang over our lives every day as we isolate ourselves from people and as we wear masks and as we kind of hide who we are. And um, I wonder sometimes if God hasn't called Christians to be the ones that take the risk to reach out. Jesus certainly set that example. And as you read through history, you won't, you won't, you won't hear these news stories in the, in the national news media. You won't read it in the history books of your, your, your European history from school. But in all of the different crises, the bubonic plague and different things that have impacted our, our world, you will find at the very center, the epicenter of the plagues and the diseases and the wars and the problems, you will find Christians <laughs> bandaging wounds and risking their own lives to, to share the love of Christ with other people. And I hope that the Christians today, in the 20, 
in uh, what is this 2021 <laughs> will will be willing to do what's necessary to share God's love to the people that God brings into our lives I pray that God will bless you this 2021 and uh, that he will guard your hearts and that you will experience his pleasure his smiling face when you think about how he sees your life and I pray that God will give you uh, his peace, that you will know that the things you're doing, you're doing because God has directed you and God has led you. So anyway, um, may the Lord bless you in 2021. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love and mercy. I thank you for the things that you have allowed us to see through your eyes. And I can't help but think that this little passage uh, was something that was part of, of who you are. It was part of the way you grew up. It was the stories that you looked at when you went out to the precipice to meditate and to pray and uh, to ask God for direction in your life. And uh, I am just so thrilled to be able to see through your eyes for a moment and have this little, little obscure story about a village, uh, a Pleasantville village in Israel that uh, uh, helps us to understand who you are. And Father, I just pray that you would continue to guide and direct our lives, that you would give us courage to, to reach out and to touch people that are in need and to, to make a difference and not to be um, frustrated and not to be fearful about this COVID thing, uh, but to just act responsibly and to seek your direction and to continue to do the things that you have called us to do. And we just ask for your blessing. We ask that we would live our lives in a way that would please you this year, that 2021 would be the the season where Christians would please you everywhere, that we would hear of Christians doing amazing things and uh, setting an example and being leaders in their communities. And Father, we just thank you for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. In the name of Jesus, amen.